Hey everybody, this is Chuck here for ducescrack.com, coming at you with our installment of Beginning Omaha 8. This week we are going to move on from our initial flop play study to talk a little bit about how to play the flop as the pre-flop raiser. Uh, those of you who took a look at our pre-flop videos noticed uh, you know that our in general our pre-flop strategy is going to be pretty raise heavy. We're looking to build pots uh, when we think we have the best hand or uh, you know information dictates so. So a lot of our pots are going to be as the preflop raiser. Um, and so in this video, we're going to take a little time reviewing part one of flop play. I just kind of want to build a little bit more on how to interpret flops, specifically how flops interact with our hand. I spent a lot of, a lot of time talking about uh, planning for turns and rivers, and there are actually a couple of tools out there that can make it a lot easier for us to do so. Uh, then we're going to talk some about playing the flop as a preflop raiser and actually wrap it up with reacting to preflop action, uh, specifically as the preflop raiser. Um, because so much of our preflop strategy is done with respect for postflop play, I kind of think this is going to be easier to understand and kind of go through after we talk a little bit about our generic game plan as the preflop raiser. So in general, when we see a flop, and this is probably nothing new to many of you because this is as much as this is for 08, it's just in general the way to, I think the best way to approach poker, uh, first and foremost, our preflop play always prepares us for the flop or post flop in any way whatsoever. I've said that a thousand times though, so we can move on from that one quickly to uh, second, it's important to evaluate your hand strength. Um, now, when we evaluate our hand strength, we're not just thinking about how strong is our hand right now? Like, do we actually have the best hand? Because again, um, having the best hand on the flop is worth nothing. But when we're evaluating our hand string, we're actually trying to figure out, you know, how strong our hand can be on future streets. In other words, we're always acting with consideration for future turns and rivers. Um, we took a look at some different flops last week. And I think the next question really becomes, how can we evaluate our hand strength? What's the best way to look at how strong our hand actually is in 08, how can we fare on turns and rivers? Uh, my favorite tool for this, and it's a free one, is uh, Pro Poker Tools. The old school deuces cracked uh, videos where I learned 08 from Joe Tall. Uh, he had me uh, hooked on Pro Poker Tools. And I think specifically when it comes to Omaha 8 or better, there's a lot that this offers us that... Uh, you won't get in just simple equity calcs. So in general here, I actually have the 10, 4, 5 flop, flop from last time and tried to pick an example that was pretty uh, pretty obvious, but we have here the, you know, rat plus nut flush draw versus made bottom two pair with, you know, top set backdoor draw, etc. cetera. Um, and we get our equity numbers here. Uh, in general though, we're not that excited about that. Um, I blew up on the uh, on the bottom here the breakdown of uh, the numbers on the right that we're given from Pro Poker Tools, and I want to talk more about those. And I kind of blew up the flop here to make this a lot easier. Um, so, how does this help us in planning for turns and rivers and evaluating our hand strength? Well, there's a lot of numbers out here that aren't just included in equity. Uh, first and foremost, there's trials. And you see 820 exhaustive. Uh, exhaustive means all possible runs of the deck that can actually come out. 820 is a huge number, right? There's a lot of things that can happen. But if you think about it, it's really not that big. And when we start using tools like this to evaluate our turn play, the exhaustive possibilities, because there's already eight known cards, you're down to 44. We can plan for 44 different cards. And what's even easier is using that same shorthand and the same approach we used to post flop, I'm sorry, pre flop, uh, we can bucket these down to four or five different occurrences that are going to come our way that can we really plan for. And when you start breaking things down that much, it makes your action on previous streets literally that much easier. So when you see these trials exhaustive, it's important to realize that the numbers we're looking at here in front of us. If we played this hand every single way possible, which there's only 820 ways that the deck can run out, 
Um, and it's actually fewer given their opponent has some blockers, but well, they're, they're accounted for in here. Uh, so that's not true. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, but in, in all these different ways, how is our hand going to fare on uh, later streets? So in, in general, in like a Texas Hold'em game, we can just look at equity and be happy. And, you know, when you start getting to the flop and you start getting to the Turner River, th this becomes a much clearer number, right? Pre-flop, our equity is going to be uh, so much closer because it's a four card game that looking at these situations um, is not going to be nearly as beneficial to us. So uh, we don't need this number nearly as much right now. What I'm looking at more often than anything is scoops. Uh, and we see here that 69% of the time, and what I've actually done was these numbers with the percentages here on the right are originally done, if you notice from the previous slide, in absolute numbers. So they're not done relative to the number of trials. So when you see, you know, 500 and something scoops, it's, well, what does that really mean? But here we see 70% of the time, almost, we're going to win the entire pot. Like our opponent is going to have no share of it. That's a really bad situation for our opponent out of position, especially when we're going to win a low 74% of the time. How often is just a low going to come in? Um, that's obviously not, yeah, yeah, no, any low is going to be good for us here. Um, the ties are not nearly as important, but these numbers here on the right, give you a much clearer picture of how this hand is actually going to play out, right? We see wins high 69, 31. So yes, this villain is actually going 31% of the time going to hold on the high end, um, which is a little bit more than their equity because 74% of the time we are going to be able to take half the pot away from them with the low. Uh, now, on paper, when you see these numbers, you may think, well, that's how this hand's going to run out. Therefore, maybe Kings doesn't want to fold in all these other spots. But we also have to think about how those turn cards are going to make our hand look. Uh, what turn cards can we bet? Um, what turn cards do our does our opponent want to fold? What turn cards could our opponent possibly raise? These are all things we're going to consider on top of these kind of generic numbers in front of us. But I love using pro poker tools for these situations because it gives you a much clearer picture about how a hand can possibly play out, right? So when I'm sitting here with ace, two, three, six, with my flush draw and open edge straight draw and backdoor flush draw, I know that almost always I am going to be able to take down the low and I'm going to make uh, a high hand that's going to win. As opposed to with king, king, four, five, knowing you are never going to win a low with this hand and your high is only going to be good 30% of the time. So even though the villain, you know, our, our hero in this hand is only going to win 70% of the time with the low, a strong, like it, it's a lot of times that a low card is going to come in. We now have to hope our high hand holds. Um, I mean, this situation is really a disaster for that hand. And I like using tools like this to kind of visualize these situations. You won't really have to rely on them. Uh, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about flop play, and I will include some actual examples and some live play, et cetera, et cetera, to kind of familiarize yourself with this. But as you kind of want to develop your own game and grow from here, or even just look at situations, the first stop, I think, is typically a tool like this to kind of evaluate exactly mathematically where did we stand, right? You know, one of the, the fun things about a, a game like this is because we have four cards in our hand, it just makes a few less trials, right, that can possibly come. You know, there can't be a three or six of hearts on the turn because we have them in our hand. Uh, that being said, the equity from hand to hand can become a lot more confusing, right? That's why it's good to have this kind of breakdown here. It's kind of I skip that number and go right over to scoops and see how I'm going to have a fair with my high hand and my low hand. I see here I've got a strong favorite as a high, a strong favorite as a low. We're in, uh, you know, build a pot town. All right. So just that was just a little review of kind of interpreting flops, another tool you can use yourself to move on. Now, as we're getting to the flop, I want to talk a little bit about general population reads. Uh, this is how I'm expecting most players to be acting on the flop. When I talk about the factors that I consider in a hand and the things that maybe change my generic strategy, uh, anyone who's not fitting this bill per, like almost perfectly, uh, I'm doing some things a little bit differently against, and we'll continue to build on that today, though, of course. So population reads, how does your average 08 player play 
uh, limit 08 player. Uh, number one, I would stubborn, I think is, is a fair word. Uh, there's kind of a a unique thing that happens in in poker, and I think it's more so in four card games than in two card games, but it's kind of a tying yourself to the pot based on your preflop holding. I.e., someone has waited all day for an ace two. You better believe they're not folding that ace two. You're going to get a lot more ace twos just because you have four cards again, but uh, players in general are a little bit more stubborn post flop with their okay holdings and uh, try to look at all of these things with like rose colored glasses, if I could borrow that phrase. But it's this is, a, this is a good thing, right? When some players are stubborn with their pre flop holdings, they are not going to be able to release their hand when they should post flop, and we're looking to exploit that later. And this kind of ties into the loose passive read. Stubborn plus loose pass passive may seem a little bit odd. Um, maybe not. But in general, I'm expecting players to be willing to play a lot of hands we're not willing to play, specifically from certain seats. Right? Um, 08 is a fun game because, you know, the old school approach, the, you know, the point count system kind of says, is a hand playable or not? And it doesn't really do anything with respect for positions. So maybe players are willing to play the same hands we are, but they'll play them from every seat, right? We're opening 40% of hands from the button. Well, they'll limp that 40% from under the gun. Um, but I'm expecting most players to be on the loose side and in general passive. Now, where is the bright side of that? Uh, that really often can make a raise a pretty big red flag. Right. If people call or fold 95% of their hands, we know what they do with that 5% when they raise. We know the type of hand they're raising. And that's something I'm going to always keep my eye on to kind of put myself in a more plus EV situation post flop. And finally, and I think this is the one that most players overlook. Um, a lot of people have very weak 08 fundamentals. People are willing to call with these hands out of position. Uh, that are just going to be drawing, like people are not going to fold king, king, four, five on a 10, four, five um, when in a huge multi-way pot, when they're not getting nearly the price to draw. Um, players are going to call you with worse lows and worse highs. Uh, I had a fun hand the other day where I literally got called by the nut, nut, worst, worst. In other words, the worst possible low and the worst possible high. Um, uh, that's kind of a poker riddle. So I think I'm going to leave that one up for now. Maybe I'll comment in the thread, but uh, I, don't, I think this is something a lot of players don't get used to when they're coming over from Texas Hold'em or any other game they've played a lot is just because this is a game a lot players, a lot of players really aren't taking us seriously or they're kind of dabbling in a little bit. Uh, so they go off on just whatever advice they can put together or they're trying to figure it out. And even worse is the players that have been playing for a long time with weak fundamentals and haven't been punished for it. But this is something I'm always looking out for. I'm looking for situations when someone does something that is on paper is mathematically a mistake. Uh, that is one you put on paper <laughs> in terms of reads on that player to try to exploit on future streets. So now that we've talked a little bit about how other players play, let's talk now about uh, ourselves, right? How are we playing as the preflop raiser? I think it's important to spend some time focusing on flops like I did in the last video and just talking about general reads so you know how to interpret other action a little bit. But uh, in general, what's our strategy look like after we're raising preflop? Okay, so uh, post-flop play here. Number one, we actually are going to be continuation betting a lot. Now, this is a big function of our number one point. We are acting street to street with consideration for future streets. And much of our pre-flop strategy is allowing us for situations that let us continuation bet a good amount. Uh, if there's a lot of players behind us, we will have stronger hands. So in general, we're going to flop better, right? That's a reason why we are more selective pre-flop. Um, it's also important that we are looking to build pots on the best flop for our hands. Uh, we'll talk a little bit later about slow playing and the upside slash downside of slow playing. But in general, when you do flop well, your goal, number one, should be to build the pot as big as you can, uh, as quick as you can. Because we know we have an equity edge. We know, A, players can't evaluate their equity appropriately. That's part of bad fundamentals. Uh, B, 
Players are going to be a little bit more on the loose and passive side. So passive, we can't really count on them to build pots. And loosive, I mean, sorry, loosive, uh, uh, loose, we shouldn't expect them to fold all too much. So putting in a bunch of money seems like a pretty good plan to me. And finally, post-flop, I talked before about players raising in situations and raising being so rare. Uh, it's very important that we respect uh, aggression. And we'll talk about interpret afterwards, but respecting aggression uh, can be the difference between you calling two bets on the turn and river uh, with near zero equity and you just falling to a flop raise. All right. There are going to be players so tight that they will almost always have a hand better than us post flop. There are going to be players who only raise on the flop with two good pieces. In other words, high and a low, a little bit of that raisin brand potential. And against those players, when we respect their aggression, we are able to uh, kind of get away from our hand. When it comes to interpret, you know, I talked before in the previous slide, and even on this same one about the lack of fundamental understanding of some situations in 08, right? That ace 2 3 6 to king king 4 5 on a 10 4 5 spot where a player maybe puts a raise in because they have two pairs, uh, even though. Their hand is not very likely to be best on almost every possible run out. And this is something you're going to run into, especially those of you new to the game, those of you who are playing maybe in some live games, uh, you know, 4 8 oh, 08 games ago, or those of you playing in some of the smaller micro stakes games, seeing that kind of kind of out of the box thinking that doesn't really make sense. Um, that's the what I really put in my interpret bucket. <laughs> um, you know, and, and that's really where I think the importance of planning ahead for future streets comes into play because someone check raising you with a hand like that or raising you with a hand like that is probably pretty good if you're willing to call every flop and then fold every turn because, geez, I mean, who cares? Um, so we, we want to kind of keep an eye out uh, for players that don't really seem to understand what they're doing and try to get a feel for the types of hands they think it's correct to jam or the type of hands they think it's correct to call down with, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, as I get more and more detailed into post-flop strategy, I think it becomes a little bit more important that we actually see some live plays. So I'll be back with a couple of sessions uh, coming up over the next few weeks to kind of hammer on any of this stuff. And those of you with any questions, of course, or specific examples, definitely feel free to post them here on the thread. So we're the preflop raiser, we raise, um, what are some factors I want to be considering when I'm deciding whether or not to continuation bet? How do I want to uh, proceed in this hand? So I, I put these in kind of a, the X, Y chart here, right? On the bottom X would be the, the independent variable. So the, the thing that can change from hand to hand. And I am going to change my continuation bet as a function of, in this situation, the number of players in a hand, right? What's gonna happen when I raise and I get like five callers? That's a pretty straightforward one, right? This is an, a negative correlation, they call it. In other words, the more players in a hand, the less likely I am to continuation bet. And that's not to say I need to continuation bet less. The reason why I'm continuation betting less with more players in a hand is because I need a stronger hand to want a continuation bet, right? I, I there's more players in the pot, so it's actually more likely someone's going to make a better hand. Uh, so you need a little bit more on later streets. If I paired my three on my ace three, jack 10, and the board is king, king three, I'm not even dreaming of betting, as opposed to if I did maybe raise that hand on the button, I might see bet to try to take it down. Um, you know, we, we, could, we could almost replace uh, players with position, but I, I think independently saying that I am going to continuation bet less out of position is a little dangerous because the real reason I'm going to continuation bet less out of position is because I'm expecting there to be more action behind me. Um, so it's actually more a function of the number of players in the pot here. Uh, but in general, something to keep in mind, right? And, and this, this one's kind of obvious. I feel like when there's more players in the pot, uh, we should expect, um, uh, us to be continuation about a little bit less and typically doing it with more hands. Okay, so now what if we swapped a uh, number of players for uh, fold equity in the same way I could have swapped number of players for uh, position? Well, obviously the less fold equity we have, 
uh, kind of the less we, we want to be betting because we need a stronger hand, okay? But at the same point, specifically when it comes to four card games, that drop off in the opposite direction shouldn't be nearly as steep. Uh, in other words, when you have no fold equity, and this is a really common thing specifically in limit games, players saying like, oh, villain is never going to fold here, is never releasing their hand on the flop, they always peel. Uh, it is really important that you plan for the turn in that situation and give yourself a wider turn barreling range. We don't want to look at a situation where someone is never folding and turn that into a coin flip situation because equities can actually run so close and all these other post flop spots can get so dicey. We want to spend less time kind of letting the hands play out and more time taking charge of the hand. This is something I learned a lot from playing a lot of PLO, right? Getting peeled by like really weak two pairs on boards. It's like checking in those situations lets that villain show down and own that piece of equity. But meanwhile, like we saw that situation before with King King, and one of my favorite <laughs> examples, obviously, but that weak two pair on that board, even the equity doesn't matter that much to me because I look at the runouts and I say, I mean, you're going to be taking a lot of fire all the time. It's going to go turn 10 river queen or turn queen river 10 or something like that. I mean, and it's just your, your four or five is going to get a lot worse in those situations. And people who never fold the flop end up with hands that weak. So it's important for us to open our value range and potentially open our bluffing range. Uh, the value range is the first one that I'm always looking for, right? Maybe if I'm always betting top pair plus nut low draw, well, against these players, you better believe that second pair plus third or fourth nut low draw is basically the nuts. So why are you not betting that all the time and excited? Um, this kind of goes under the, the same rose colored glasses file that I, I had uh, kind of opened up before, but uh, not being opportunistic in these games is just going to kind of leave you victim to the rake and makes the variance a lot bad, a lot worse too, rather, because um, you're just trying to make good hands, which is not easy to do. It's easy to get people to fold. Uh, it is because you can find good spots to do so. It's easy to interpret other players' actions, but just kind of letting hands play out, you just leave money on the table. Uh, we've finally uh, kind of flipped this one here completely here now, and this is going to kind of transition us to our next slide where we cover some of the bigger leaks um, that I tend to find from players playing as a preflop raiser, but money put in and hand strength, you better believe is a positive correlation. Okay, when you have a good hand, jam the pot. Which brings me to my next slide, common mistakes, and the first one is slow playing too much. Um, logical inconsistencies are probably the biggest leak of the thinking player, if that makes sense. If you're using your brain at the table and you're really trying hard to win, it's situations where you ignore other factors and you don't take them into account where you're going to be making a mistake, right? That same players don't fold ever, I don't want to see bet as much, yada, yada. Well, when you flop a steel wheel, which is a straight flush wheel, uh, you should bet then because people aren't going to fold. Um, that's a big reason why we're checking those flops. We're checking those flops because we don't think anyone's going to fold. And you know, when we're checking with multiple players, right? We're not expecting anyone to fold and we don't have anything. So we should just give up. Now, the observant player is going to see something like that and say, well, geez, Chuck actually bet a uh, three, four, six, two spade, uh, you know, three spade board. I'm expecting this guy to actually have ace two at least, right? But we went through our population reads. Was observant on that list? Absolutely not. Um, slow playing is uh, is also can cost you a lot of money because when players don't have solid fundamentals, they can jam pots as equity dogs. They can call down too much on later streets or just more importantly, put in bad action later. And if they're going to give you bad action later, you might as well make the pot as big as possible because then their action just going to be worse. Um, when we make the pot big, and give our opponent better odds to call, but we have a hand that's so strong it doesn't matter, that's a really profitable situation for us. Uh, I'm not saying never slow play. Right? If I was to flop like a royal flush or something um, in a heads-up pot, I would probably consider checking uh, against certain players in those situations. But when you have a large multi-way pot with a lot of players out there, don't hesitate to jam and just build that equity edge. Um, I always like to think of these situations as spots where 
every chip that comes in on the flop by uh, equity, equity, and, and we're obviously, uh, we're talking a lot about equity, even though I said you can ignore it on the pro poker tools, but uh, it's because when I'm looking at my equity, I'm seeing where it's coming from on the various runouts. And I like to think of like, oh, for every dollar that comes in, I know I'm getting 50 or 60 cents of that back in the long run. This is great for me. You know, I want all this going three or four ways. That's, you know, $2 on the flop here. Um, and I think taking that approach as opposed to trying to be tricky and think about getting that one big bet in on a later street uh, is way better. You know, I, a lot of the overlap from 08 is from PL08 or NL08. Players just like the split pot game and they like the flop game. So they kind of maybe overly respect that extra big bet that goes in later. I mean, I can't stack you when we're 100 big blinds deep in uh, 808 unless you want to put a ton of bets in. Um, we could maybe do the one day uh, how many bets game with Chuck where uh, those of you on the merge network, there is no heads up cap and 40 big blinds I got in pre-flop against Jax in 08. So we can just let that sit for a minute. Games are good. Second biggest mistake I tend to see is hopeless peeling. I talked a lot about how different a 10 and a 9 are in terms of uh, in their Broadway type, uh, in Broadway or high card type hands, basically saying like ace 10 has a gut shot on king jack 3. Um, you know, on that same king jack 3, uh, ace 10, 3, 5 versus ace 9, 3, 5 facing a raise from someone there. Um, you know, ace-10 has four scoop outs on the turn there, right? King-jack-3, ace-10, 3-5. A three can be pretty good too. Ace-9, not so much, right? None of our two pairs are looking very good. Um, if we hit the ace, that's an okay spot, but we have no backdoor low draw. Um, a lot of those, a lot of turn cards are going to cause us to fold. This is a pretty good situation, I'd say, when I'm facing aggression with a hand like that. I like to think right through how many turn cards can I actually play? Um, and we'll, well, this will be a, a theme kind of coming up here, but in general, uh, peeling the flop when you know you're going to fold the turn almost always is just a common limit hold'em or limit flop game mistake. People call once thinking they're get a good price. Pause, just enumerate it. Think like, geez, I can only call like four turn cards here. If it's four, there's no way you should be calling, right? Once you're hitting double digits, you're almost always going to be getting a decent price. But uh, hopeless peeling is just leaving small bets on the table. You know, in, in these games, yes, you can beat them very well. But uh, let's say you have a three or four big blind per hundred win rate. Well, as soon as you're going to be lighting off uh, half a big blind, uh, I'm sorry, big bet win rate. If you're going to be lighting off half a big bet, just peeling flops twice every hundred hands, let's take one off right there. And this is one that I think is just so easy to avoid. Um, these are just, you know, quick checks. You can run these pro poker tools. You can, uh, post them right on the thread and say, Hey, this is an easy fold. Right. And yeah, absolutely. And, you know, finally, I think, I think another big mistake people make, especially as the preflop raiser kind of tying back into that, getting attached to your preflop holding is just ignoring information. Um, our HUDs do us a big favor in giving us some data and letting us know how other people's play. But when the tightest player at the table calls the flop or over calls the flop on a nine, nine, four, that player is not calling you with pocket sixes. Like there are just some spots in 08 where the information is so clear and players are so cookie cutter straightforward in some situations where we can make the most exploitative or just egregious folds or raises or calls on later streets um, and not using that information to your advantage is you know just a huge mistake uh, that same player who only plays ace two only plays ace two post flop and keep that all in mind and acting post flop without consideration for other people's pre-flop actions can be a pretty big error as well but we'll talk about that a little bit more when we talk about uh reacting to other players pre-flop play which is going to be right now. Um, oh, you know, a big flop, a big, big, big part of uh, how we're going to proceed post flop is done with consideration for other players post flop play. Um, specifically, when we're open raising, much of what we're open raising is based on the situation, right? We're under the gun with the following four cards, therefore, we think we should raise. 
But then there's more information that happens. Players can call, players can three bit us, et cetera, et cetera. How does that change our approach to flop play? Well, first let's talk about the most obvious one, which is getting cold called. Specifically when we're open raising from early position, uh, we get cold called from players in certain seats. Uh, what am I thinking about? What am I trying to decipher? What am I, you know, how am I going to act? Well, the first question you should ask on that same note before with ignoring information is, is their hand better than mine? Now, when I open raise under the gun and under the gun plus one cold calls, this isn't a very common occurrence, right? When I open raise the cutoff and the button cold calls, there was a very real chance that like the 1811 that just cold called you on the button uh, has a very, just a better hand than ours at a really high frequency. Um, same thing if a tight player calls from the small blind or something like that. There are just some situations where players are so tight passive that they are going to have a better hand than us almost always when they call or a hand on par with ours. So in those situations, I need to dial down my post-flop aggression. I need to have a little bit more respect for my opponent's potential post-flop holdings. And I'm really not going to expect to win that big of a pot. And you shouldn't expect to win that big of a pot against a really tight nitty player. Because uh, the only way you really can is if you cool with them or they are bad and make some bad post-flop mistakes. But um, anyway, question number one, is their hand better than mine? As silly as it may sound, uh, I would be hard pressed to find a, a session where you're not gonna have at least one player so tight that they only play hands better than the ones we're willing to play. Uh, the second question then is how is my hand on the flop? Uh, this is just goes back into evaluating hand strength uh, in general. We don't want to be mindlessly continuation betting, but uh, if we have any kind of piece, I'm going to be pretty happy to see bet into one player. Once you get into two or more, uh, I really slow it down quite a bit. You're getting a better price on the bet, but there's just so much more that can happen post-flop. There's now eight cards we're playing against, against four versus four. Um, more importantly, what I'm thinking about when I am betting, though, is how many turns can I bet? In the same way, I want to enumerate those turn cards that can come that are good for my hand in uh, a situation where I may be facing, facing a check raise. I also want to enumerate the turn cards in my mind that are going to be good for my hand that'll let me continuation bet do they, do, uh, the turn. Do they give me a gut shot? Do they give me a straight draw? Do they give me a low? Do they give me top pair? Uh, and how is that? And when I say how many turns can I bet? you know, what is top pair worth, right? Is the is it a three, four, five all spade board? And I've got, you know, all red Broadway cards. I don't care about top pair there, but maybe I flopped a gut shot plus third nut low draw. You know, I've got a three King Jack three, four on a 10, 10, six, two, you know, suddenly a Jack is an okay turn card. A queen's a lot better, right? Because it doesn't make a straight for eight, nine, 10, uh, I'm sorry, 10, six, two. So none, none of it, none of it would. Um, but a jack's a good turn card. We could have the best high hand there. Uh, king's a great turn card. A queen is an okay turn card too. We can bet again. Uh, now, yes, it's a 10-6-2 board. We're not expecting a lot of fold equity, but what if we go back to that? This player never folds the flop, flop type character. Well, if someone is literally has a 0% fold to flop continuation bet, you better believe you want to have a lot of turn cards you could bet. So I'm trying to think in my mind, how many turn cards can I bet and the, the number, the I want to find more, the type of hand I'm willing to bet on the turn gets a lot weaker once I am against a player who's not folding a lot on the flop. That should be a pretty clear connection, but if that's confusing at all, definitely let me know, and uh, I can maybe go through a couple of examples. But, uh, you know, when I'm cold called, these are all things I'm trying to think about. And specifically, uh, these last two are very good ways to kind of just approach uh, playing poker with people left to act behind you. Um, you know, we, I, this is the kind of the, the core of acting with consideration for turns and river cards. Now, getting three bet is a much different story, specifically when it comes to 08. What does villain's three bet range look like is the first question. The, the kind of silly way I like to, to phrase this is, what does this player actually think they're supposed to three bet in 08? Um, you know, some players think that this just means high only hands because I want to isolate this player. And sometimes they'll do it in egregious situations. 
or, oh, pocket jacks, pocket queens, pocket kings, pocket tens. Hands like this, because they're big pairs, I want a three bet to get heads up. Uh, I don't blame anyone either. I mean, this is stuff that I used to do. Um, luckily, I've been playing poker so long that I've made mistakes and corrected them, uh, thinking that this was appropriate. But we see now, uh, when you three bet those hands, you are not acting in any way with consideration for future streets. Um, pocket jacks is just not going to be in a great situation in a limit Omaha eight or better game, right? When it is an over pair to the board, it is in a lot of trouble. But if I don't have a read on this at all, in terms of just general population reads, I'm typically assuming this player has a very good ace two, or more often than not, just aces. Uh, if I'm trying to play a bit of a guessing game post flop, I'm just thinking, how do I fare against aces? Uh, that's kind of my default three betting range, but I do give it some respect. Uh, giving it too much respect, specifically in shorthand situations, is a huge mistake. And I promise you, uh, calling down and seeing the type of stuff players uh, are willing to three bet with is is probably a little bit on the better side, especially if you've got like some kind of two pair hand. What does villain's three bet range look like? This question really just flips itself when we think they're only on aces and ace two, and then suddenly they show up with jack nine, six, four, double suited, right? We have to play completely differently against that range. Now, if we're talking specifically reactionary in terms of my uh, post-slot play, uh, I'm not even thinking that much about the flop in a three-bet pot. First and foremost, if there's just the two of us in there, you've already got at least six bets if it's a blind versus blind, but I think I'd be misleading you if I said we're talking specifically blind versus blind here. Uh, we're talking about us opening from some regular seat and getting three bet. So you're going to have you know at least seven and a half bets in there, getting eight and a half to one on the flop. You need you know a little bit north of 12% uh, equity to be able to continue there. Uh, not many very good runouts are necessary is the way I like to think it. Um, and we can then just basically say, How, how's my hand going to be on the turn? You know, am I, am I going to be calling this flop and folding to every single turn card? All right. Did we get three bet and we have ace two, five, five, and the flop is king, queen, two, or we have, you know, ace two, nine, nine or something. And the flop is king, queen, two, like we're just going to be folding in it, all the turn cards. And I'm not going to bother uh, continuing with this hand, but uh, how is my hand going to be on the turn? Is my hand going to be so strong on the turn that I want to uh, raise right now? Which kind of wraps me into our final point, which is should I lead? Because the other thing you should really count on in general, in, and we're going to talk about this more when we're focusing on out of position post slot play, uh, specifically in like raised pots from other players. But uh, as much as we're C betting at a high frequency and trying to take down pots, a lot of players are more passive post flop. They're happy to take a free card. They let that whole, oh, villain never folds, dominate their thought process. And if that's the case, sometimes it's important to pump the brakes and, uh, well, then hit the gas and lead the flop, right? But take, take control of the hand uh, from the villain because we're not actually expecting them a continuation bet. Uh, three bet pots are not a very common thing in 08. And anytime you get into rare air in any game, players' mistakes are going to be a lot more frequent, right? Uh, people get better at things with practice that just, even if you don't mean to do it on purpose, you will get better at something if you do it every single day, simply because you're practicing. Now, because the three bet pots are not nearly as common and the pots bloated, and usually if they've got some kind of big cards, they've either got a, you know, uh, low draw, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, uh, can draw the top pair or an over pair itself. Uh, players are kind of stubborn. Players don't know to fold. Or maybe they think they're supposed to raise. Who knows? But in these situations, uh, especially when I flop well against kind of sporadic players, I think defaulting to them as the preflop raiser can be a pretty big mistake. This is the kind of innovation that you've seen a lot kind of over the last few years in Nolum and Hold'em and PLO and all these other things. And I'm happy to bring it to Omaha 8 or better and kind of open up my game in different spots to try to increase my win rate. Hopefully this was a good breakdown in terms of how to approach some post-flop situations in uh, specifically flop play as the pre-flop raiser. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit next week about defending out of position, playing multi-way pots, and maybe looking at that pro poker tools to see how other streets may run out 
when there's a lot of players in there and then dive into some live action just so you can get a feel for uh, kind of how the games are playing and how I'm using all of these factors, all this information to make my post op decisions. And until then, this is Chuck for DeucesCrack.com and I'll see you on the forums.